Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.
minimal um, developer input because you, you want a very low startup cost for to be able to add annotations to code and start finding bugs. Um, we need to be able to tackle these extremely large bases, and we want to um, maximize the accuracy and coverage, both of these, to um, just improve the general effectiveness of the engine. And then um, lastly, that we want to be able to infer annotations for a, whole, for a large variety of properties, because while at least initially we, were, we could focus on one particular aspect of the program, like buffers, that we want to extend the annotations that are being inserted to source to, um, to, to look at a whole variety of correctness properties. Um, I'm going to say that to designing the analysis, that it's really um, that it's really the semantics that the engine uses that are really the key to um, to achieving these goals. That we want that we want um, the engine to be able to model the program to um, a to a degree to sort to sort of facilitate these. I think that um, that I think. Part of the problem that we had with um, with, er with earlier versions of the inference engine was that it had um, it had very limited understanding of the properties that it was trying to analyze. That um, it would require some seed annotations or other information, and um, and this this would both cause um, increase this both require additional um, developer input before you could effectively annotate a code base, or and as well as um, sort of decreasing the effectiveness because. None of these properties are very straightforward. That you have to really, you really have to have semantics built into the engine that are really, um, that that really anticipate the sort of problems that you can get while trying to annotate, um, while trying to annotate this property and to, pro and to propagate information around that will allow you to do so. So, um, and combined with the fact that you want to be able to infer annotations from any code bases, it, it leads you to suspect that you that you want to be able to customize the engine to the property that you're analyzing. That you don't want a sing that you don't want a single Strategy that you're going to use for for inferring annotations on all the different properties that you're looking at, and um, if we look at how other um, analyses handle semantics, I mean mo most analyses use a fixed set of semantics. So there's one property that they're trying to analyze, and they're going to take um, they're just and they're just going to to um, customize a set of semantics to that property, and then use it to um, to analyze to well, to either um, infer annotations on or to check correctness on or a variety of other things. Um, and second, that we have um, the sort of we sort of have analyses that are sort of hybrid, where you're going to have one aspect of the semantics that's built in to the analysis, and a second aspect that's user specifiable, user specifiable one way or the other. I mean, you use either um, say a finite state machine specification, or use like customized um, models of how a function behaves, and so on. Um, a problem with this is that you're still is that you're still somewhat limited. By um, by, this, by the built-in aspects of the analysis. I mean, this cuts both ways because you could, while well, you can very carefully tune that um, that aspect of the analysis to improve the general level of quality and to require less input on the part of the user, is that it's still limiting when um, when the parts that are built in are going are going to provide conflicts where you where there are multiple properties that um, that want to behave differently with respect to those semantics. I think um, I have an example of this, which is which uses the um, ESP value alias set. Which, um, which is um, which is an aspect of ESP that's going to be tracking value flow um, through the program originating from a particular point. So it basically it's just going to be following assignments, tracking what set of things holds the holds the value that originated at that at the origin point. Um, but with something like this, that even though it uses a fixed set of rules, we still may want to customize its behavior. If we're say using the value alias set to track aliases for the constant zero. And then um, an increment operation will destroy elements of that set. That if it was zero earlier, it's one now and no longer in the set. Whereas um, if we're using the value alias set to track um, tainted integers, then what we want to do is that if we see an increment operation that earlier we had no control over the value of this integer, we've only incremented it. So we've, we've only shifted it by one, and, it's, and we still have no real control over that value. So we want to keep it in the value alias set. But the problem is that. If you can't customize the behavior of the value alias set, you can't have a single um, you can't have a single set of semantics that can capture both of these properties that can capture both of these sets. Um, so it leads us to what we what we wanted to do with the um, inference engine, which was that we wanted to more or less completely customize the semantics that the analysis was going to use in um, in inferring annotations in the source code. Uh, the approach that we're taking is to sort of model. The, the engine's behavior on um, on using a proof system, 
but we're going to use the specification to supply this proof system and use the engine to sort of um, to sort to sort of find to, to find all facts that are drivable using that system. And this, this proof it's most that it, we sort we're divide, we're dividing um, the um, the facts of the system into states and annotations. But we're going to say that a state is really just a predicate on um, on a single program point. It's going to say that this is some information I have about the program when it's when it reaches this point. I'm going to say that an annotation is a predicate on the program as a whole. When I've inferred an annotation, I've learned something about the program itself. And then we have rules for driving states and rules for driving annotations, which are all supplied by the specification itself. Um, this leads us to the example of how we want the engine to work, which, um, which we're going to be looking at input, output, and required parameters. This is, this is um, one of the aspects of the sound macros that, is be, that are being added, added to, Windows, to Windows code. Uh, when we talk about in, out, and required, we're interested in which pointer parameters are input to a, are, are used as input, used as output, or are required. If a parameter is input, then that means that at entry to the function that it contains data that will be read by the function. If it's output, then that means that at some point it could be written to by the function. And we can have a parameter that's both input and output. And um, a required parameter is one that must not be null, so that the function is allowed to um, access it directly without checking it first. Um, our approach to this is that since at function entry we don't know how the, param how the parameters are going to be used, what we want to do is that we want to find the access points within the function itself, trace back from those, and find out, find out which data had originally flowed in to that access point. And so if we take an example like a string, a string concatenation function that's going to check its parameters for null before um, doing any accesses, what we see is that we have one, two, five accesses in the program that's going to be reading from X as well, and it's going to be both reading and writing to X and reading from Y. So if we mark um, each of these sources, what we're going to say is that each of these each of these source points is a three tuple where we have the value that could be accessed, um, a, just a flag indicating whether it's a read or a write, like R or W, and then a flag indicating whether the value will be checked before it is accessed, which is, again is either Y or N. And then what we can do is that we can take um, say this XRN at the left side and, um, and sort of follow it back to entry to string cat. So this first statement Y equals B is irrelevant, so we're just going to skip over it. We see this X equals A, and we're going to say that since, that, since after the statement X could be accessed, then before the assignment A could be accessed. Add that there. And then since we see that, that since, since the access to A will be guarded by this conditional at the entry, then we're going to say that it will be checked for being accessed. And then um, similarly for these other two, I'm going to push that up there. And then um, this only tells us what the, what the possible accesses that could occur at entry to the program are. What we want to do is that we want to take these possible states and turn them into annotations. So what we want to say is that if at entry to the function, we see that any particular variable could be read without being, and, and will be accessed first, or, and will be checked first, then we want to add in. So we'll do that for A and for B, which both meet that condition, if it could be written to and, be, and had been checked first, then we're going to add out. And for any of these, if we find that a parameter could have been accessed without being checked, then we'd also add rec, which is not in this example. Um, that's so that's, and then um, part of the issue, though, is that this is sort of particular to the, um, to the, to the problem at hand, which is, this, which is finding out these in-out rec annotations. What we want to do is we want to describe how the engine um, can, discuss, can, can actually how to specify these rules that we use to propagate this information backwards from these access points to the function entry and, the, and to infer the annotations. And then, so what the specification does is that it's going to take, it's, 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 it's mostly just a state description. What this is going to do is going to list the possible states that we're interested in that, that can hold at each program point. Um, it's, going to list source, it's going to list source rules, which describe, like, how do I infer um, sources, how do I infer states directly at particular points in the program, and transition rules, how do I take existing states and propagate them around. And then finally, it's going gonna, it's gonna to list the possible annotations you can infer using a state and how, how to do that from the possible states. Let me just take, so our, again, with the state that we're just going to take, is that it's a predicate on three values, um, about, like a value, a kind, and a check, where value is the location to be accessed, kind is the access to be performed, and check is whether a null check will happen first. And um, in the specification, this is just sort of expressed. It, just, it is very, basically, orthogonal. 
it's, it's parallel to the action there. Um, so, Ryan, yes? So what we're going to do is here is that we're at the bottom we're showing the syntax that you use in the specification problem. We're going to have to dwell on the syntax itself. But since there's nothing built into the analysis about um, about in out parameters or any or anything like that, then you can just sort of specify in the file what it what what this what this what this property actually means. Well, the, I mean, the annotations don't have to be um, attached to particular values. They can be, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it's fully interprocedural. Yeah. This, this was a single function example, but um, in, but uh, as we'll talk later, that we're that we're using it to infer annotations where on on um, on an interprocedural scale and tens of millions of lines of code. Um, well, we talked about how the engine actually operates. Basically, yeah. Well, it depends on the property you're trying to analyze. That I mean, with in out rec, it's it's fairly straightforward that some that some of the errors that could occur are are you just you're not going to correctly detect that a check is going on, or if the programmer expects some sort of correlation that you don't know about. Then you will infer incorrect annotations, and there's not there's no fundamental contradiction there. I mean, you should, you, these, there's, in the same way that there's no contradiction between in and out, that the engine will never will never say that it suspects a bug in a particular place. What you do is that you just sort of give the system derivational rules, and then you can look at those inferred annotations and look for patterns in those that could suggest bugs. But it's not, it's... Uh, uh, the first thing that we did is the shelling. We found a bunch of mutual mismatched bugs because the interchange of the same API that it's taking a wide access to frame, right? Uh, and it was a special engine. Yeah, the byte-nome account, yeah. But so, the engine won't report that as a bug. You look at the output and decide that that pattern is a bug. Yeah. It depends entirely on the specification. You can write a specification that's either going to um, going to rule out paths where that is. Where it, you can write it. You can write that the analysis itself is not context sensitive. We can write specifications that, um, that at the cost of some completeness, will allow you to will allow it to effectively be context sensitive, where it's either going to go only or it's only going to follow a particular path in the call graph. So if you saw, I guess, well, there, there are two there are two aspects to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well. You, a lot of it's that, that they're not really types. That a lot of times when you talk about a type, you're saying that this must be of this particular type. Whereas with taint, um, one of the annotations that we're looking at is this is possibly tainted. So it's not saying that this must be tainted. Yeah. So I mean, there's no there's no real inconsistency between a function that's sometimes called with tainted data and sometimes not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in, in, that, in that case, that you get inaccurate annotations according to what the programmers suspect. It cannot occur. So, for instance, think about the whole salad for the window. Okay. A salad is window related. It's limited to the extent that it's limited to the extent that you're not allowed to say that from different folders that the API can be used. Okay. But that's not something that the engine can know. That's something that. When you apply this engine and do this result, you decide for your code base, your organization, how you want the code to be. 
and then avoid using the front and rabbit to go from the boat and then force that when you get your phone. So it's not so easy to do that. It's not about the other. Again, it is just employing certain properties of the boat. It's not, it's, it's not finding fun. Right? You're right that some combination of different properties employed on the same parameters suggest fun. That depends on how you're using the boat. Right? You'd say that it could be tainted. It could be tainted. And part of, part of the aspect there is, yeah, well, it's, it's going to discover all the possible, as many annotations as it could. So if it sees that the function is sometimes called with tainted data, it says that this parameter could be tainted, which is true because it could be. Um, yeah. But and there are two aspects, there are two ways to discover that bug. Either when you give the annotation to a programmer to review, they can say that that annotation isn't right. So they're going to look at the path that you use to generate that um, thing and see that it's sometimes called with tainted data and fix that. Otherwise, well, they might not know, but if they, if they said, but, if you, but again, that this, that the inference engine isn't the whole story, that on top of this you have a checker. That if, the, if the programmer decides that, oh, this annotation is wrong, it's, it's really not tainted, then when you add that annotation and do checking, then you'll see that call where it's, Oh, it's the checker. I mean, you can't. It's, if you have, if you have a strong checker. No. Okay. Okay. So this is just the state description. Um, if we move, if we move on, so I, so again, like we wanted to describe um, for the in rec specification, what is the what are the possible states? What are the source rules, the transition rules, and the annotations? We just go through each of these in turn. What we want to say is the sources. We just want to mark all the points before direct accesses within the program, and um, we're going to say so the location that will be accessed and the kind of access depend on the depend on the particular point. Whereas um, we know that it won't be checked first because none of these accesses are guarded or conditional. So then we're just going to state the state access. We're going to say that source where is the value of the kind and no for check um, immediately before such an access. And with this, this with this access, what we're doing is that we're going to define um, syntactic patterns on the code, which are defined elsewhere in the specification. So we're going through some detail. Um, um, and similarly for the transitions, what we want to do is that we want to follow assignments backwards. We want to look for places where the value is going to be checked, and then um, and then otherwise that we just want to propagate things normally. That um, which gives us a similar thing where let's see. Again, this is this is really just saying the same thing. But. Um, the annotations, what we're going to say is that since, since again, that the states were predicates on individual program points, they didn't have to say anything about where this state was feasible in the program. The annotations, however, have to specify what function they are applying to, what parameter they're applying to. So each annotation is a two-tuple, either in, out, rec, uh, that takes the function and the parameter name. And then what we want to do is that we want to take the possible states of function entry and use those to infer these annotations. We're going to say that um, that it's an in annotation if the parameter could be read at entry, it's an out annotation if the parameter could be written at entry, and it, it, it's a required annotation if it could ever be accessed without being checked first. And then, so for patterns, I mean, again, this, these are you know, fairly straightforward. It's um, we're just matching against syntactic structures, and these take arguments so they can be, they only match against arguments, and they only match structures that match for a particular, um, for particular values of arguments. And, um, so here we're just matching assignments from an offset of the right-hand side into the left-hand side. So again, with um, that we want to be able to customize the behavior based on the property we're analyzing. If we see an assignment where like x equals y plus five, back in string cat, way back here, 
that if we if we see that um, this that this line that this line x equals a was really x equals a plus five, we'd still want to um, we'd still want to have the same result because since a plus five is an offset of a, it means that a's contents could still be accessed when x will be accessed. And then um, the patterns can be fairly simple. They can also be um, extended to a very large degree. So like this is offset. So it's going to match several different kinds, or many different kinds really of expressions that are offsets of a particular expression. Um, and, the, and the inference engine, again, is, is, is really just, is, is not particular to in our record to any other specification. What it's going to do is it's going to take the state description that's provided by the specification, the program to analyze, and then basically run with that. What it's going to do is that it's going to define this dep dependency graph, which is really just expressing what, all the, what are all the transitions over each um, control flow edge as implied by the transition rules. And then it's going to find all the source, all these points that are sources as implied by the source rule on the specification. It's going to explore the subgraph of the dependency graph reachable from there. It's, it really is a straightforward graph reachability. And, um, and then take those reachable points and add any annotations that are implied by them according to the inference rules. And then, again, since nothing about the specification is built into this, that it extends easily to a variety of other properties. That um, ones that we'll be looking at are just buffer sizes, paint. Um, there are several. There are several different kinds of data formatting um, information that could, that can be interesting, such as um, finding it, what, whether data, whether integers must be bounded or whether um, strings must be null terminated. Um, information about error codes. Like we're trying to figure out like how does the function indicate its success or not and then obligations about um, heap allocated data and, and really any other type of resource obligation. Um, the buffer sizes, what we can just do is that we can start, since, again, that since we don't want to, we don't want the developer to have to go into the code and indicate um, where, where, buffer act, where buffers are being used and figure out how to propagate from there, is that we can either um, just use stack buffer information or, um, or, just, or just build in the um, ways, or build in the heap allocation functions that are used by the program. So what we do here is that we just see that we have the stack buffer declaration in FNA. We're going to say that the address above has um, has a byte count indicated by the number 100. When we see that we're calling FN um, or we're calling clear with that information, we're going to add that here. I mean, again, that um, that since the one, since the 100 might not necessarily be the count, that this is sort of an unsound um, approach to propagating this information, but it's been very effective. And then we can also propagate that information backwards to FNB. We're going to say that buff is, has an element count given by CCH since we saw that multiplier in there. And then we can add um, the corresponding annotations to clear and FNB. And the same, you know, the buff spike count is given by CB and buff's element count is given by CCH and FNB. And you cannot, you can you don't, these annotations don't have to be added directly to functions either. You can infer annotations on structures too if you see assignments of buffers into structures. But we have not evaluated that approach yet for noise. Um, again, with tainted data, that since the approach that is being used with Spice to propagating, data, to propagating tainted data around is to take all the entry points, either control entry points where you could be called by a malicious user, or data entry points where you could be receiving data passed to you from a malicious user, and then we're going to take that information and propagate it forward. So if we see that there's a data entry point on read, then we're going to say that at exit from read, then the contents of PV are not to be trusted. So we're going to add that here. And then when we, pat when we come back to FNA, we, we propagate back out. And we see that buff is no longer to be trusted. When we, when we call check string, then we're going to see that check string is annotated as validating this buffer. And we're not going to propagate anything further. We're just going to be adding this annotation to read. Um, we do here in, in integer bounding, if we go back here, what we want to do an approach that, that could be taken to integer bounding is to say that there are certain there are certain operations in the program that require integers to be bounded in a certain way, and we want to take we want to take those requirements and then push them backwards in a similar fashion to in out rec. But again, that the that the actual that the actual operations as you transfer back as you propagate this information can be very different from in out rec because now you're concerned about integers rather than pointers, and you're concerned really about the sort of bounding operations that are being performed by them. So if we say that this that this access um, buff sub temp requires um, both a lower bound and an upper bound on temp because otherwise it could be an unbounded access either underflow or overflow, then um, we want to add both of those bounds on temp, both of those requirements. 
when we push the, um, the lower bound backwards, we're going to see this assignment um, from pause, push that there. When we come back to the, um, the call to write, what we're going to see is that this value s pause is really the maximum of pause and zero. So we're going to say that s pause has a, has a lower bound of zero already placed on it. And we're not going to propagate that any further to safe or right. When we propagate um, the temp upper bound, what we see is that since we have the state, since we have, since we see that temp is being compared with len, we're going to say that instead of establishing an upper bound on temp, what we, what we really need to do is establish an upper bound on len, the length. So when we see that here, we see we need an upper bound on the length, and then when we propagate that back, we can just propagate all that, that all the way back up because it's never compared with anything. When we get the annotations, we see that um, that right needs both the lower bound on pause and upper bound on len, whereas safer right um, does not need any bound on pause because it'll, it'll check that first. Um, move this on. Mold formation is a similar, it's a similar situation. We just want to push, we want to detect points where it looks like the program expects a string to be null terminated, which is down um, at this while loop, and then propagate that information back until we see um, an assignment of, until we see that the string is being null terminated. And then um, the error codes, there's um, there are a few different approaches here. One of the things that um, one useful piece of information about a function or one of the possible error codes that it can return um, is generally not, is generally rather difficult to do for uh, larger functions because there could be thousands of error codes that they could return and it would just, it would just really clog, um, really just clog the source or clog any database that you're trying to collect about that information. What, what you can do and what we, what we are looking into experimenting with is trying to figure out if you could sort of, if you could exploit these error codes to, um, to try to infer what are the how, how functions actually indicate their overall success or failure. So if we see that, um, that a function return, sets the last error to zero when it returns true, then we're going to say that that's when it's, that's when it's succeeded. Um, and obligations, what? Oh, there's the, these are just constants, so it's just 32 bit constant. That's what they're trying to find in, too. I don't know. Uh, yeah. We don't have access to the macros, unfortunately. But if we see, if we see that, if we're, we're trying to figure out means there are functions that that return boolean to indicate success, but they could either say that I return all. Um, False on success or true on success. We want to figure out is like what is the difference between those two. So we want to play around with is using um, error codes to do that. If we know that the function sets an error code, um, a, a non-zero error code before exiting, then that's showing means it failed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just. This specification we haven't really tested out yet, but it's just we're trying to um, develop ideas about how to infer um, success conditions for non-standard functions. Um, the idea is that with the specification, that since you have pretty much complete control over the semantics, that um, that if you find that a particular specification is giving you a lot of noise, is that you can find ways to reduce that noise by um, tuning it to um, Either, either to change the approach that you're using, or to, um, or to just do more fine-grained modifications to ignore certain operations that code will do. Um, um, where it forgets to set, where it does not set the last error, where, where the last error is non-zero, but it still succeeded. If, I mean, I'm not sure how many functions um, use mechanisms similar to this, so we're going to see how effective this is going to be. Um, well, there are two. There, I mean, there are two main. There are two main sources of noise. I'd say it's either that the specification is understanding the program, or that, or that there is that inconsistency. And we're, I mean, you can see both, both many examples of both in the results that you get. So you can you can only um, I mean, you can you can tune it to reduce the noise that you get from um, from the problems with the specification, or you can just ignore them if the amount of noise you're getting is low enough. And then obligations. What we want to do is that um, since we don't since we don't know um, from if we, one approach to obligations would be to follow forward from um, allocation sites and just see what what parameters are being um, and what or what what assignments have originated from there. Um, we've been looking at the problems is that there is that 
obligations use a sort of linear logic, whereas regular assignments don't. But if you follow, um, if you follow backwards from the points where those obligations are fulfilled, like freeing heap allocated data, then you can, um, then you, sort of, then you do get that sort of linear logic approach of following assignments backwards, and which can be, which can be successful in figure in, um, in determining what, which pointers are actually on the data they point to. We start immediately after a call to free. We see that PV is that that W free is obligated to free PV through the or is, is obligated to free PV. That FNA is obligated to free PV, and whoever calls star whoever calls W malloc is obligated to free star PPV. So um, we're going to add the D ref returns obligated to the pointer of the annotations. Um, yeah, those two annotations are that. and that's. Well, that's sort of the examples that we kind of collected there. I mean, as people have pointed out, that there is um, that all, that all these that all these um, specifications are unsound and cannot can could never be expected to get all correct annotations, which sort of leaves us um, sort of leaves us to to um, to try to figure out what the proper role of soundness and completeness are in the inference engine. And what we mean by sound is that if, if the inference engine was completely sound, we'd say that all inferred annotations are correct for a given specification. And if it was complete, then it managed to infer every possible correct annotation. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so the the inference engine is never is never concerned about bugs. What, you, what it wants to do is it wants to figure out what the contracts are and then allow local checkers to do strong checking, searching for bugs. And since the inference engine is fully procedural, then it cannot afford to do very expensive operations. But it, it, it's just, it, for the most part, it is not passed on to the government. That's a meta-level comment that uh, we could have made at the beginning, which is that the whole, from a research point of view, okay. the whole approach you're pushing here is that there are some problems with uh, the nature of inter-procedural, mm -hmm. but that kind of complex checking is very difficult to escape. Mm -hmm. So the approach you're taking is with a cheap global engine to infer its contract, mm -hmm. and then you're using a very strong local engine to enforce those contracts. Mm -hmm. And either the contract turns out to be not strong enough and a bug is reported, or the code is wrong and a bug is reported. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we check complex properties locally. Mm -hmm. right? That's really what we're trying to do. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah that's, that's part of that's the, the whole system that we think about, that we have the annotation language and the checkers, and then the inference engine and developer support. We're good. Back here. If we think, if we think about the soundness of the inferred annotations, what we mean is that um, this refers to how many of the inferred annotations are actually correct, whereas the completeness refers to how many of correct, how many of all possible correct annotations were actually inferred. Um, again, we see, we see previously that useful specifications are generally neither sound nor complete, generally because um, because really have, having um, a completely sound specification is generally going to really pretty much sacrifice your completeness and Having a fairly complete sac um, specification is going to again sacrifice soundness. And we see with the in-out rec specification that it's unsound in the sense that it cannot accurately detect all possible checks on a value. So I mean, we've seen examples of where it's um, where it's incorrectly discovered um, rec annotations, for example. So the um, annotations that I uh, yeah. That's what the developer think of as well. The completeness is not noise, right. but but having um an ad, but having an engine that is that is not close to complete is still a problem. It's still a burden for developers because ha because missing annotations means that they have to be added manually. They both both need to be avoided, but um. Like As, well, yeah, it, it, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you have to write the specification to do that. But the specifications can interface with SAL annotations, so you can say that if I see these, if I see these preconditions or postconditions, then I can add a possible state there and propagate that information. So yeah, that may depend on the spec. Yeah, but, but I think the point is unless. Yeah. You're 
in between, you get the human to come in and add more things that the agents didn't already figure out. Then that could have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah, depending on the specification, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so ra- rather than striving to have a specification that's sound or complete, what we want to do is that we want to use soundness and completeness as metrics to evaluate specification. We want to say is that the soundness of a specification is sort of the fraction of inferred annotations that are correct, that the completeness is the fraction of correct annotations that are inferred. Um, what this does is that having, that having these two um, having these two simple numbers lets us um, have a, a nice little graph that really gives a visual representation of, how, of what the performance of, an, of the analysis is. If we take a fixed point, if we take a point in this graph, what it's saying is that if we fix the property we're analyzing, the specification we're using, and the code base we're analyzing, then this is the performance on that. If we um, have one and one, that's sort of perfect performance where it inferred every correct annotation and no incorrect ones. And if either the completeness or the soundness is zero, then it's useless. So we want to strive to get up towards that upper right corner. Um, if we if we fit and if we fix um, you, you can, by by fixing aspects of the system, then then you can um, they sort of get a sense of how the performance is doing. If we fix the property we're analyzing, the specification we're using, then by um, by by, char- by charting the performance on different code bases, then we can get a sense of how well the code base is analyzing um, is analyzing all the code. If we see that that several um, the several code bases are clustered in the same area, then we can see that those code bases have, have that it's ease of understanding those code bases is similar. Whereas if we see a potential outlier, then it means that we want to investigate that code base and see um, why is it why is it performing so poorly on that. Similarly, if we fix the um, the property of the code base we're analyzing, then we can um, view um, refining specifications as sort of an incremental process of improving the performance. Where if we if we just start with an initial specification, find um, and then run the inference, find um, ways in which it's generating bad annotations or missing ones that we wanted to find, then we can um, correct those within the specification, rerun it, and really get a, a really get a good sense of how the performance is changing as the specification improves. And, um, and this, is so, this is sort of the way that we, that we want to use, this is sort of the approach that we want to take to um, analyzing or to evaluating the results of the engine on various specifications. Yes? Are you determining uh, what are all the annotations that it should Sampling. I mean, th- I mean there, are, there, are, there are a finite set of annotations that it, needs to infer, that it needs to infer. I mean, if you knew what all of them were, then you wouldn't need to run the engine, so wouldn't you sample any so to estimate the proportions? Um, we'll, we'll talk about this in the results. I mean, it, it depends on whatever you're analyzing. If you're analyzing a toy program, then you can get exact proportions. On the larger code bases, we'll be using sampling to estimate those proportions. Hmm? Yeah. If you take a, if you take an annotation that should be added, because I mean there there's a set of annotations that are correct according to the property. Oh, it's not well, it's not the case that you're not going to infer any annotation. It's that if that if you have a particular um, if you have a particular annotation that should be added, the correct annotation. What is the what are the chances that you actually infer it? What I'm saying is that, yeah. I mean, the, the point in the y-axis is really what is, what is the proportion of annotations that we sh- that that are correct, and versus how many that we actually inferred. Uh, you know, just think about the function that's working specifically and we don't have a model. Look at the results. I mean, so the, spec- the, main, the, the main runs that we performed um, have been running, have been trying to find out parameter usage, like in, out, and required, versus, um, as well as buffer sizes. And we've run this 
Oh, we, were, we ran it separately on, I think, 14 or 15 uh, Windows depots that totaled um, somewhat over 200,000 files, 120 million lines of code. And um, on, seven, on all the ARP machines, this took uh, about five days total. Can this be the first slide? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, have to make, you have to know what it's. <laughs> okay. All right. And so we've got 1.8 million in outright annotations, 420,000 buffer annotations. But those numbers don't mean too much when you don't know how the performance is overall against the code base. Well, that's that's what it said. Hmm? Well, that, that, if I if I if I do a naive line count against the code base, that's what I get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not it's not actual. It, it counts line lines and other sorts of things. Hmm? Yeah. 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 But um. Yeah. Hmm. It's a, it's a lot of code. <laughs> um. And then so, the, so if you look at the in-out re record results, I mean, there's a th we don't just have the coverage and accuracy, which are the um, completeness and accuracy measures, but um. Let's have a fraction of estimating the proportion of code that we actually successfully analyze. Um, part of the problem is that I mean, when you have these large code bases, that you're not going to be building everything, and the engine is going to fail at some point to actually to actually analyze a block of code. So this is this is the proportion that just from sampling that we're estimating how much how much of the actual definitions did we find, did we were we able to analyze. And if I take um, these numbers for these three depots and put them in the graph, then we get um, this. Which so, I, so we can see from this that the um, that the accuracy is very good, it's generally between uh, 95 and 100 percent, and um, the coverage is generally um, between say 70 and 80 percent or so. Again, that, that's after um, that's after cutting out the code that we did not analyze. But, so the so the disks indicate the 95 percent confidence intervals because these are samples. Um, this is these, these are for in out and rec annotations, and then so we're doing and then for sort of for buffer annotations we analyze three other depots. I mean analyze the shell and both, but the other two are different. You can probably get somewhere numbers for the same depots, but haven't yet. Um, and then for these, this the performance here was not quite as good. Um, what we're finding is that the accuracy is generally between 70 to 80 percent, and that the coverage is really all over the map. Um, so we need to look at figuring out how how do we get um, end user up towards shell in terms of performance. I think one of, one of the big issues there is that, um, is that we're only analyzing individual depots and we're not incorporating buffer information from um, that sort of that crosses between code and different depots, mainly from um, calls at the base. So you have global analysis of individual depots. Yeah. You analyze everything in base together. You yeah. Everything in base plus. Yeah. You can, you, we can't, there's a capability there to propagate that information. We just have to do a more involved run. If you use the hierarchical structure, then you could do this better? Yes. Then you could do this better? Yes. Yeah. So we have 90 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't have numbers for that yet, no. I'm curious, so this is kind of like marginalized average behavior for the computer. If you look at the units that are more efficient, and um, we haven't, ha we don't really have those numbers yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, th I mean, intuitively, you'd think that, I mean, since since it's really not feasible to get preferred performance on any reasonably sized code base, then um, you, you are going to see some, some anti-correlation. But to the degree in which you get that is not quite clear. Are there some specifications that will give you more of a bow shape, some that will give you an inverted bow? This Probably. I'm sure it is, yes. Yeah. So, to, some, to some degree, there's overtraining there. That you, you write a specification for shell, and then you're going to get better performance on shell and middling performance on the other depots. But part of it, part of it depends on the trade of the code base itself. 
that the shell, yeah, yeah, the shell, the shell uses a lot of strings compared to the other depots. So that's that's what this that's what we I mean we don't have numbers for this yet but this is sort of plotting as you refine a specification how do you do is there sort of some for a particular property and code base is there some where's where the upper limit on how effective a specification can be yeah like, like, well for any particular code base you could always get to one at one just by <laughs> I'll write down every correct annotation in for those yeah. No. The, the developers just have to worry about annotations. What you want is that whoever, um, that the that since the inference engine is run, um, is is sort of is is really a centralized run since we're doing these huge inner procedural analyses. That what you do is that you have someone who understands the engine very well and probably has probably worked on it to some degree, um, write the specifications, and work on those, and then um, and then perform the run, just generate um generate the annotations and give them to developers. Um, you you run it on smaller code bases and look at the results and do, you can keep you can continue doing sampling like if you want to do um, sample for completeness then you can look at what are the correct annotations how many of these did I find how many how many should I be finding and then figure out ways given that given the ones that you missed how would you go about finding those and then for accuracy it's it's somewhat simpler where you're gonna say that I'm gonna look at my annotations and gonna look for wrong ones and see why did I find these wrong ones and then find ways to correct that in the spec. Yeah. 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 And that is the problem with customizing the semantics is that you're describing really the entire behavior of the analysis, so you really need to know what you're doing. It's just a, a drawback there. Um, and then as far as taking these buffer results, what, we, what we've done is that we've combined the, um, the in-out information and the buffer information into the actual um, SAL macros, and we managed to um, boost the buffer accuracy to more than 90%. The, now, with, now, with the buffer um, noise, there are really two main causes of noise. It's very rare for it to either find um, a buffer, a value that isn't a buffer or a value that isn't a length. What it tends to do is say that um, is, to, is to get sort of the binder element counts confused, again, possibly because of Unicode bugs or other, um, or other complicated behavior that the code is doing. And um, second, that it can, if, if a function takes uh, many buffers, then it can sort of get their lengths confused. And then you can, these are fairly easy to resolve. You look at the Hungarian notation to resolve the, what the proper size is, and you can look at the edit distance between the buffers and lengths to resolve cases where you have multiple lengths. That's just like how many um, how, or how many deletions, insertions, um, or swaps do I have to perform between the, yeah. between the buffer and its length. So, so, we're, so we're, look, we're looking at traits of the code base. Yeah. It's similar. And it's just the approach that this is this is something you can't really express in the engine. No, this is, these, are, these are my wacky rules from looking at the noise that we were getting. No, these two rules do not go into the specification. So where do they go in the processing? To the generation, to the generation of the macros. Okay. The use, to, yeah, there's a back, there's a there's a backend tool because we have to combine the in-out and buffer annotations anyway. So the tool that does that um, is going to be applying these rules. This is. Is this is sort of the raw accuracy that we get just from the engine, and then it can be boosted further in cases of a very complicated specification like the buffer one. Uh, byte and element count. Byte and element count. It's basically is is this length indicating the length of the buffer in terms of bytes or elements? I think that leads us to the um, the conclusion, which is um, 
I, I just feel that, that from the results that we're getting in that rec and, and from the um, range of specifications that we can provide, that we feel that, that um, a completely customizable engine it really is, is very adaptable. It's shown it to be scalable and accurate on these sophisticated specifications, and that's more or less it's just a generally effective approach to annotating which code bases. Any questions? To a degree, yeah. It's mostly a complexity versus accuracy issue. If you want, um, if you want a complex enough checker so that it can, um, so that it can really give you strong checking while being fairly low on noise, then you really have to go with a local checker because trying to do any sort of global checking of a sophisticated specification or a sophisticated property like buffer overflows is really intractable. Whereas, from a theoretical point of view. There is, there is also another, there is, yeah, I think that there's, a, there's an engineering issue here. Like, take the bumper annotation, right? Consider this Office of Windows in the contract, right? In Office, what they've done is they said they have some Hungarian notation based inference frame, but they don't go into the program. They are only known to the tool. And the tool is even the user identified plus. Okay, whereas in Windows, the developer that expects it is checking the annotation. And the reason they bring it out in Windows is because it generally improves the quality of the program. Because the programmers are thinking about what the code is doing and they're putting down the specifications that are changing. So, yeah, it's a little bit I think uh, even if you had a completely tractable global engine, Sure, you would do that first to get root out bugs, but mm -hmm. in the long term, this is the advantage that people are writing down the contract. Like some days, I'm sure I think that some of you are probably going to use the practice program. For that one, for that. But one thing I would say, at least with Microsoft, the way we have done the whole annotation approach from day one is just increment. Step one is get the company to a point where people take it as a set of practice that you add to the limitations to the code. And you do that by taking a small subset of the system. Once you get to that point, then we will deal with the research problem of, so how do you have the one amazing spec language in which once and for all you say everything you want to say about your code one hand, right? That's definitely step two. And there are people in this room who are qualified and able to think about step two and they are, right? And we are thinking about step one. So we have all this about a bit of the pipeline. We are trying to take the mentality of so when you come along and say, okay, I'm going to take the idea. That's a lot of questions. You're trying to discuss some of these things. Yeah. 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 I think this annotation is going to generate X amount of bugs, but there's some other annotations that are going to generate X amount of bugs, and you can use that to find what you're down on, what are, maybe, maybe you can say, well, with 100% confidence in the annotation, but I have some bugs that are going to be a little bit more accurate than the annotation. Based on what kind of information is there. That's what I mean by the problem. And basically trying to um, do inference by checking, by looking at the noise that you're getting based on, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of that is that it requires, um, is that it requires a checker. That for some, they, that I mean, we started the buffer annotation effort before we had a good checker. That, um, that you, that you can't have everything that happens in the same direction that you want an annotation language to be, um, in solid development, that you can get, um, the code to be annotated, and then you can really start checking it. Parallel, but um, that's that's one thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we did. We don't. I mean, because right because right now we're just focused on annotating because we have other tools for checking now. We 
Yeah, uh, that, that's that's the whole idea behind the engine is that we want is that we only want to approximate the behavior. There, there, I mean, there are two ways. You could do it either way. Right? Well, the approach that we're taking right now is that we say we want to get these annotations to developers to code review first before checking in. The second approach, you say that I, I don't care about code reviewing. I'm going to check them all in, run the checker, and see what noise pops up. And the, I mean, the problem with the second approach is that, you're, that you could be adding bogus annotations to the code, which is not going to confuse just checkers but developers. Yeah. Right. Like, how does how the development culture work? I, I think this decision was we want developers to see and we want them to have ownership of their code. We want them to learn what these look like and how to add them themselves. And so the process that evolved was we're going to make a bunch of suggestions and then ask developers to go code review and you know, people who are that market and submit them. Rather than we're going to go edit a bunch of your code and now you're going to see a bunch of bugs that create the web which just freaks everyone out, right? And just kind of surprises everyone and makes them feel like, you know, I just told you about this. But at least once a week, I, I have a night where I think maybe that's what we should do. Especially when you get all these cells from VP saying, what is the amount of the stack? And how many man hours are we spending reviewing these applications? So that's when you have a night nice session. Mm -hmm. right? And then you wake up the next morning and you say, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, no. So, yeah. A lot of it has to do with how easy the code base is to analyze. That if it's going to be tough for the inference engine, it can be tough for the checker too. But. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you get the bugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and again, a nice thing about the infrastructure is that you can sort of customize it. That if you're seeing points where it is getting confused, you can you know, tell it to basically stop what it's doing when it reaches code like that, or train it to understand that, or approximate it, or really whatever 
um, whatever maximizes what sort of utility that you want out of it. Part of it assumes some familiarity yeah, with the that's old which is a, last which is a year, actually, this slide. He gave a talk last year mm -hmm. at the initiative, and uh, that time he stressed more about this approach where um, the, basically the whole process of uh, getting the developer involved and uh, later um, so we have this graph of uh, the input, the point by checking from the code of view, and uh, when you